Enough. So, uh, warm up activity, uh, another movement analysis. So, let's get reacquainted with all that. Work together, movement and muscles handout. What's the first question that you ask? Yeah, 
So if it's extension, it's really flexion. Gotcha. There's lots of good discussion out there. How's it going? Oh, because it has so many more. Yeah. Yep. Get eccentric for the second one as well. So it's flexion. 
for the selection. selection. Right. But then you use the other these ones. ones. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's not the movement that changes. It's no. the same movement. It's the muscles that change. The muscles. Okay. Thank you. I like how you're explaining it. It's flexion. It's flexion. That's all I've got. It's flexing. <laughs> I mean, I understand what you're saying, but explaining it to someone who had no idea what this means. So it's the whole lot. Okay. Oh, that's right. Um, 
a lap pull down. Okay. Out here, and then as you pull down, the, the scapula would swing. Gotcha. Okay. You should be starting to get groups of muscles in your mind that are just automatic hip extensors, horizontal abductors, and so on. You should be able to recite those without too much trouble. Uh, let's go ahead and, and get back together and go through it. So for the right leg, again, the first question, always ask. Uh, with at least weight training is lifting or lowering because that determines the muscle action. So going from left to right, it's lowering. So it's going to be eccentric in both slots. Uh, the joint action um, eccentrically is a flexion of both the hip and the knee joint. Right hip, right knee joint flexion. Uh, but because it's eccentric, we have to look at the opposing muscles. So the muscles that actually extend the hip and extend the knee. Uh, so your four hip extensors, gluteus maximus, and then the three hamstrings, uh, and then your quadriceps uh, under the knee muscles. Uh, this is a sagittal plane movement. So axis for the sagittal plane <coughs> is the frontal axis. So, uh, good job on that one. Most almost. Everyone just went right into it without too much trouble. Um, <clears throat> the next one is a case where we have the femur fixed uh, with the pelvis rotating about a fixed femur. Um, so it's just another version of hip extension. But uh, we start with uh, the phase where uh, the torso is being lowered. So you know it's going to be eccentric. But uh, from left to right, the hip is, hips are being flexed, so it's eccentric flexion. So we have to look at the extensor muscles. So again, your, your four hip extensors uh, from before. Uh, plane is sagittal, axis is frontal, so front to back. Uh, the next one has a, a few more subtleties to it, especially uh, towards the end of the movement, but if we consider what is mostly going on uh, for about 90% of it. It's going to be horizontal, horizontal abduction at the shoulder. Um, so you go around to page one of your movement and muscle sheet. Horizontal abduction is associated with what action of the scapula? Mm -hmm. Adduction, or what's the other word we have for that? Retraction. Retraction, right. So um, we've got a few different retractors. So Rhomboids, what else did you get? Middle, 
yeah, middle lower trapezius for the retractors. Uh, for the plane of motion, uh, because the arms are uh, abducted like this, so we're, we're working our way around the body. So it's kind of more of a transverse plane action in, until the very end, which would be more sagittal. But for about 90% of it, it's going to be transverse plane, uh, longitudinal or vertical axis on that one. Uh, shoulder joints. Um, so you have your five horizontal abductors, posterior deltoid, uh, terrace, minor or major, remind me, minor, minor. infraspinatus, uh, zlatismus dorsi in there, so what am I missing? Yeah, middle, middle deltoid, yeah, middle and posterior fibers of the deltoid, so, um, and then uh, transverse vertical or longitudinal on that one. Um, okay, so the next one, um, great exercise um, if we're looking at improving our overhead squat technique um, to, to train those muscles that keep the arms overhead. Um, so in this one, um, we're going front to back, forwards and backwards, so it's going to be a sagittal plane action. Um, what I was looking for on this one is flexion, although Ty brought up a great point that um, it could be uh, scaption. Um, with scaption, there's a little bit more pronounced angle, so it's kind of more of a Y type action with your shoulders. Um, so I was looking for a little more just straight ahead on that one. So um, even if the hands are pronated, it's still uh, flexion. Um, what'd you get on this one? Lifting or lowering? Lifting. 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 So it'd be concentric. And then you have your uh, pec major upper fibers, anterior deltoid, coracobrachialis, post three, uh, sagittal plane, and frontal axis. So, okay. So keep that. Um, those are your anticipation points for the day. Get you warmed up. We'll just keep. Doing the same thing over and over again, but pretty soon you'll have all the muscles memorized for different joint actions. Okay, so my goal for today is finish up chapter three and then uh, get through about half of chapter four. I've got a few great video clips on different practical applications. So. Uh, with, with this course, I, I kind of like to bridge the gap between uh, the A and P and the application. So, in other words, this is kind of an applied anatomy, applied anatomy class. So, when we left off, we were talking about different types of levers in the body. So, how many total types of levers do we have in the body? Three. Now we have three. And so they're characterized by the position of the fulcrum, the axis, and resistance. So if I gave you a lever example where you had the fulcrum, which is the, the axis, okay? So we'll say axis and then the force and then the resistance. So axis, force, resistance, A, F, R, what would you tell me? What type of lever arrangement is that? Third class, very sharp, Tyler, good. So AFR, so do we have an example in the body of that? Our classic biceps brachii example that's used in every single textbook. Um, so I've been doing this 18 years, so I've seen a lot of them. Um, okay, so then what if I gave you one where it was axis, resistance, force? So ARF. Second class. And why is the second class more advantageous than the third class? So how do we calculate that mechanical advantage? Length of the moment arm for the muscle or resistance? Moment arm for the muscle divided by the moment arm for the resistance. resistance. If it's greater than one, then you know you have a, have a mechanical advantage. So we have very few second class levers, but that's a case where the moment arm for the muscle is greater than uh, moment arm resistance. So then first class lever, you have 
If I gave you F A R, as the, the axis is in the middle, right? So that's first. Does the axis have to be in the exact middle? No. So one side or the other. If we want the muscles to have an advantage, then the axis is going to be further away from the muscle force. Um, the resistance, if it's closer to the resistance, then the muscles are going to have to work really hard to uh, lift that. So if the resistance lever is greater, so if the axis is further from the resistance and closer to the muscle, then that means it's going to be difficult to lift. So muscles have to produce a lot of force uh, to make up for a very short moment arm. So, okay. So moving on, let's talk about motion. And so we have to have a net force to generate motion. So a change in, in the state of an object or body, we have to have a net force. So we, we always have, have forces acting, but if the forces are in balance, we have no change in the state of an object or body. So we have to have an imbalance in forces in some way to change the state of an object or body. So the muscular system generates internal force. And then we have gravity and other external objects that generate external forces on our body. So all these things can interact to create a net force. And our bodies move in the direction of the net force. So there's two types of motion that we can have, uh, linear motion and angular motion. In reality, we have both types of motion most often. It just depends on what part that we're focusing on. Um, so linear motion is also called straight line translatory motion. So an object or body moving along in a straight line is called translation. Straight line rectilinear translatory motion. So we can have linear motion taking place due to the coordinated action of multiple joints. So a couple different types of linear motion. We can have rectilinear, which is a complete straight line. So think of a cyclist gliding along a flat section of road uh, would be rectilinear. Curvilinear is motion along a curved line. So think of a football punt. Okay, so punting down the field in an arc would be curvilinear type motion. So angular motion or rotary motion is the type of motion we have in our bodies. So rotation around a central axis. So our joints represent the axes about which our body segments rotate. So all of the motion we talk about flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and so on. Uh, these are angular type motions. So it's angular type motion at our joints, and then we have multiple angular motions taking place over multiple joints that enables linear motion. So if we put linear and angular together, we have general motion. So we can pretty much look at any practical motion and we can pick out parts that are angular and parts that are linear. So if we look at uh, walking, okay, the body as a whole, if we look at the body as a whole and the motion of the body as a whole, that might be linear, but then if you look at the joints and how they're moving to produce the walking action, that would be angular. Uh, if we look at throwing, if we look the, at the trajectory of the ball, okay, so the ball from one point to another follows a curved line or maybe even a straight line. But then if you look at the motion of the joints that produce a throw, that would be angular. And what if we had a really fast camera, and even though it looks like the ball is traveling in a straight line from the point of release to the point where it hits the catcher's mitt, what's the ball doing as it travels sometimes? Spinning, which would be what type of motion? Angular. So we can have a combination. Just depends on what, what we're focused on. So let's talk about Newton's laws. So Isaac Newton was an English mathematician, lived back in the late 1600s. 
And he wrote this book called Principia that uh, talked about these three laws that we still use today that is all about what causes motion. They all have to do with force. So the law of inertia means that a body or object will tend to remain at rest or move along at a constant velocity unless acted upon by a net external force. So the state of a body or object remains the same until there is a net force. So if a body or object is at rest, there's still force. It's just all the forces are balanced. So as soon as the forces become imbalanced, then we have a change in the state. But until that point, a body or object will remain at rest or continue moving along at the same, at the same speed. So in other words, we need to have a net force to change the state of motion, to start, stop, accelerate, decelerate, or change direction. There has to be an imbalance in the forces acting on a body or object. So inertia uh, means resistance to change. Resistance to change. So that's why we call it the law of inertia, the first law. Resistance to change. And so inertia is proportional to an object's mass. So the larger an object, the larger in size, the more resistant that object or body will be to changing its state of motion. So the tendency is for an object or body to maintain its current state until there's a change in forces. So until you have a net force, uh, an object or body will maintain its, its current state. So the greater the mass, the greater uh, the inertia. That's why some players, uh, athletes in the NFL, for example, are really large because they're really difficult to move. They have a, a large inertia. So the greater the mass, the more force needed to significantly change an object's state. Um, so a sprinter in starting blocks has a high amount of inertia. So the muscles have to generate a considerable amount of force to accelerate that athlete from that initial state uh, in the blocks. Okay, so that's the law of inertia. So all the forces are in balance. So the next law, the second law, is called the law of acceleration. At this point, the forces are no longer in balance. So at this point, we have a net force. So when we have a net force, we have acceleration. We have a change in the state of motion. So mathematically, we can express Newton's second law as the amount of net force is proportional to an object's mass multiplied by its acceleration. So because an object or body will have a constant mass, the net force is really proportional to acceleration. So a change in speed. So the greater the net force for a given amount of mass, the greater the change in speed. So this brings into, into discussion the concept of relative strength or pound for pound strength. How many have heard of that concept, pound for pound strength? So pound for pound, this athlete is really strong. So gymnasts are a great example. Gymnasts are incredibly strong uh, relative to their body weight. So in this sense, uh, if we can keep the mass the same, but increase the net force, and, and practically speaking, that means strength, we're going to get a tremendous ability to accelerate, to increase speed. Um, we can also rearrange this equation uh, to be like this. So acceleration is proportional to the net force and inversely proportional to mass. So mathematically, as for a given amount of force, as mass goes down, acceleration goes up. So you can have two uh, individuals 
that are equally strong but have different mass. So two individuals, they have the same amount of strength, but one individual has a higher mass than the other individual. So for the same amount of strength, the individual with the lower amount of mass will have a greater ability to accelerate. In other words, they'll be faster. This is the practical application. Um, so a much greater net force is required from the muscles to accelerate a 230-pound man versus a 130-pound man to the same running speed is another way of looking at it. So the take-home message is we want to improve body composition as much as possible. Um, if we can improve body composition as much as possible, um, improve strength as much as possible, that's going to improve the ability to change speed, to increase velocity. Okay, so another way we can think of acceleration is as an impulse. So most of the time, force is not instantaneous. What does it mean for something to be instantaneous? Yeah, like that. So more often, force is applied over periods of time. Over periods of time, force is applied. So it's the effect of force over longer periods of time that determines the outcome versus just an instant. So that's where we get to this concept of impulse. We have force that is applied over a period of time to change momentum. So force applied over a period of time to change momentum. So momentum <clears throat> is equal to mass times velocity. So mass, we could say, is constant. So over, over the short time period that we, that we analyze a skill, mass is not going to change. So what does change is, is velocity. So it's velocity that's responsible for the change in momentum because mass stays constant. So we could have a force applied over a period of time to increase or decrease velocity is the, is the application. Force applied over a period of time to increase or decrease velocity. And, and in so doing, because we have a constant mass, we're, we're increasing or decreasing momentum. So this would apply in, in, in both increasing velocity and decreasing velocity. So in decreasing velocity, uh, we want to take advantage of the time component. So Ashley's already heard all this like over, over an entire semester. So you can, you know, maybe repetition is good. So landing from a jump, landing from a jump. How can we apply this relationship of force and time? Force and time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yep, and then, then you land with your, with your knees locked, right? Hopefully not, because then we would be absorbing all that impact, impact force over a very small amount of time. So how do we effectively land from a jump? Yeah, we have a little bit of flexion in our joints. That flexion spreads the impact over a longer interval of time. So the average amount of impact is less than if we were to land with the joint's not flexing. So we take advantage of this, this relationship to safely land from a jump, to bring our bodies to a stop safely. We want a little more time to absorb impact. And over time, as we practice landing, we get better at absorbing impact. So maybe in the beginning, we take more time to absorb impact. But over time, as we become stronger and more trained and so on, we can absorb a given impact in less time, which means we're becoming, we're, we're taking advantage of more of the elastic properties of muscle. Um, so um, another, another example, so increasing velocity. So why is the wind up so important for a baseball pitcher based on this concept? 
What are we doing with a wind up? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Keep going. There's the longer if you wind up, the longer it's. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. So we're building force. The force is being built through the kinetic chain from the ground up through the lower extremities, across the torso, across the scapula to the hand, eventually being released with the maximal amount of velocity because a baseball. Just a few ounces, was it like five ounces, something like that? Um, is it going to change? So it's how much force over the course of the wind up that generates the velocity that we that we release with. So that the wind up phase is, is really important to generate greater force. So the summation of forces through this uh, kinetic chain is really important. Um, it's not the strongest person that is the best athlete. It's the person that can use their strength most effectively through the kinetic chain. So the coordinated action of multiple joints together from the ground all the way up through the, through the, through the arms. So lots of examples there, being able to generate forces through the kinetic chain. Kinetic chain is, is an analogy for our bodies. Our bodies are a series of segments that are connected by uh, joints. So it's like a chain, segments, and, and the joints are the connection point for each segment. Okay, so third law, law of action reaction. So we have the law of inertia, the law of acceleration, and the law of, of action-reaction. So this states that for every force or action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So as we're walking or as we're running, anytime we apply a force to the ground, we push down and back, and the ground pushes us up and forward. So the action or reaction is in direct opposition to the angle that we're pushing into the ground. So we can generate a tremendous amount of force into the ground. So this is Byron Jones, and in 2015, he set the world record for the standing broad jump. It was at the NFL Combine, and his jump was 12, foot, 12 feet 3 inches, um, which broke a previous record that was set in 1968 at 12 foot 2 inches. So that's a record that uh, still stands today. He played for the Dallas Cowboys for four years and then was traded to the Miami Dolphins. So he just had Achilles uh, surgery, but he must be able to generate a lot of force through those Achilles tendons. But anyway, this is him on that attempt in mid-flight. So you think about your technique for a standing broad jump and where your body is and how he's basically starting and then he's gonna coil his body up the opposite direction and then generate generate that landing. So pretty impressive law of action reaction. So it's not just how much force, but how much force we can generate in a very small amount of time that is responsible for this propulsion off the ground. Okay, so external forces. Um, originate from gravity as well as external objects. So objects that we're supporting in our shoulders uh, apply stress to the spine. So external forces like gravity and other objects are good things to an extent. So we're able to increase bone density, we're able to increase the thickness and resilience of tendons and ligaments the strength of muscles and so on. So exercise is a form of stress. This type of stress is, is good within limits. So that's where a prescription comes in because once we apply a certain amount of stress to our bodies, what do we have to do? We have to, uh, we have to allow some time to adapt. And how do we do that? We have to program the recovery part, right? Because that's when our bodies are changing. 
So we apply all this load and stress onto our bodies, but we have to have time to allow for rebuilding and remodeling. Our bodies are great. We have, we have stem cells that are present in all of our tissues that help us to rebuild and regenerate. So all the bone cells in your body are replaced about every seven years and so on. So we have an incredible capacity to, to adapt to these external forces, but it's important that we allow our body's recovery time to do so. Um, so when we apply an external load on our bodies, we have deformation that results. What does deformation mean? What's another word you would associate with uh, deformation? When something deforms, what is it doing? Yeah, it's changing, sh changing shape, right? Okay, so our tissues do the same thing. Bones have a, have a tremendous capacity to bend just a little bit. Our muscles can change shape. Tendons and ligaments have a little bit of give to them. So it's, it's this deformation that promotes uh, remodeling. So we, but we have to give our bodies time to, to initiate this remodeling process. So if the external forces become excessive all at once or over periods of time without sufficient recovery, we can have fractures, stress fractures and so on. Um, we can have dislocations, we can tear muscles and connective tissue as, as all of you know. Um, so uh, to prevent injuries, we wanna increase the resilience of our tissues. We wanna um, increase the toughness of these tissues to absorbing force. Um, force is like mechanical energy that, that we apply to our bodies. So back in this concept of impulse, it's, it's an advantage to absorb large forces over greater periods of time, or if that's not practical, we have protective equipment. So all the science that's gone into design of helmets to figure out how to absorb impact forces with less risk of injury or, or concussion and so on. So protective equipment to to deal with those high forces more effectively. So we have a few different types of mechanical loads, um, tension or stretching. So you can see that's pictured right here. So that's a pulling type of stress. Uh, compression, okay, so that's pushing together. Uh, shear is kind of like a frictional force. So we have a shearing force at, at joints between the cartilage. So over time, cartilage can wear down due to this type of stress. Intervertebral discs can also wear down because of this uh, shearing type stress. Um, we also have bending. Bending is kind of a combination of tension and compression, depending on the side that you're looking at. Uh, torsion or twisting. So our, our vertebrae, intervertebral discs, uh, undergo a lot of torsion, especially during sports where we rotate. Um, and then uh, combined torsion and compression here. So these are kind of the fundamental loads, and then these are a little more complex that we have down here. So the three fundamental ones are tension, compression, and uh, shear. So that's kind of a rough course on biomechanics. Um, like I said, there's, there's another course where we spend the whole semester talking about this stuff. Do you have any questions? Okay, all right. So it's important to have a little bit of that as a, as a, as a background for the rest of the chapters that follow. So um, that's the end of chapter three. So let's go ahead and move forward with uh, chapter four. Okay, so the shoulder girdle. So the two parts that make up the shoulder girdle, the clavicle and the scapula. Clavicle and scapula together make up the shoulder girdle. So the entire upper extremity uses the shoulder girdle as a base of support. So it's kind of a foundation for movement. So the shoulder girdle has to be positioned in just the right way for the shoulder joint 
to do its job. So from the movement and muscles handout, you should understand by now that muscles that control the shoulder girdle are different from muscles that control the shoulder joint. So we have five muscles that control the shoulder girdle, and we have nine muscles that control the shoulder joint. So they work together, but they're independent of each other. So the shoulder girdle is important because it's the only indirect attachment of the upper extremity to the axial skeleton. So the connection of the humeral head at the glenoid fossa of the scapula, eventually the scapula connects to the axial skeleton at the sternoclavicular joint. So it's an indirect connection. So there's a lot of soft tissue, ligaments, muscles, tendons that keep the shoulder girdle in place. So I would memorize this picture, give you a good hint for the next exam. Okay. Yes, she'll be given a word bank, but you'll need to be familiar with this. So this would be an anterior view. And so as we look at some of the ligaments, you'll notice that ligaments are named according to bones that they connect. In most cases, some cases not. Some cases based on the shape of a ligament. For example, you have the coracoclavicular ligaments. The coracoclavicular ligaments. So these ligaments connect the coracoid process with the lateral end of the clavicle. But each of these ligaments are named individually the trapezoid and the conoid. Trapezoid and conoid ligaments. So other places we have ligaments. We have a ligament between the costal cartilage of the first rib and the clavicle. So we call that the costoclavicular ligament here. Um, other ligaments, the superior, what does superior mean? It means above, superior acromioclavicular ligament. So that's the acromion process connected to the clavicle. So in most cases, it's pretty easy to figure out the structures that are connected based on uh, the name of the ligament. So looking over here at the glenoid cavity, that's where the humeral head connects. So uh, when we say the shoulder joint is a ball and socket type joint, this is the socket. So that's the, the glenoid fossa is the socket part of that joint. Okay, so key bony landmarks, the manubrium, that's the top of the sternum. So the sternum kind of looks like a knife. And so the manubrium is the handle of the knife. Uh, clavicle, of course, coracoid process is right here. Um, so we have a couple of muscles that attach to the coracoid process. The coracobrachialis is one that originates there, and then the short head of the biceps brachii also originates there in the coracoid process. Uh, the acromion process out here, it's a very prominent landmark at the lateral tip of the shoulder. You can, you can palpate and you can follow the, the spine of the scapula we'll look at in a moment that terminates right there in the acromion process. Uh, glenoid fossa again, lateral border would be right here. Uh, inferior angle and then the medial border. A few more landmarks, uh, superior angle is up here. So this would be a posterior right scapula, posterior right scapula. And then the spine of the scapula is, is here that terminates in, in this acromion process. So one of the other key, um, so a couple of key joints in addition to the scapulothoracic would be the sternoclavicular joint. That's this joint between the clavicle and the nubrium, sternoclavicular joint. So you can, you can follow your clavicle and you can just that point right there and, and you get rotation. It's, a, it's a, gli a gliding type joint, but with movement of your shoulder girdle, you get, you get some adjustment there. And then the acromioclavicular joint out here 
So that's sometimes called the AC, AC joint. So that one can also, with contact sports, especially that one can be uh, dislocated. Okay, so I like to add some extra stuff. So this is stuff you won't see in your textbook, but I was, over the weekend I was thinking about it and <clears throat> wondering about some anatomical variation. So uh, this was a study that looked at uh, differences in the glenoid fossa. And so they came up with quite a few different types. Um, they found that in a large sample, uh, they, they had to use cadavers, obviously, but what they found is that this was the most common type. So they called this type 1A. So you can see the glenoid is not like a, like a circle. It's more kind of like an ovoid shape with kind of a sharp angle back here by the acromion, a little more flat up here by the coracoid, but this is kind of, and then rounded down here inferiorly. So that's the, that was the most common. Um, the least common was type 1B. So this is the one that they found the least of here. And that one is a little more rounded. Um, some other things, um, anatomical variation in the acromion process. So there's three, three different categories. Most people fit into type two. So you have kind of a little bit of a slant here, but it's not very pronounced. Um, this type over here can be a problem for impingement, rotator cuff impingement. Can anyone explain why this particular hook-shaped acromion could be more of a problem for impingement? We're talking about rotator cuff supraspinatus impingement mostly. Where does the supraspinatus tendon, where does it run? Supraspinatus. Yeah, the tendon runs right directly beneath that point right there. So you have a little more tissue here that can result in, in impingement. Um, this type over here would be uh, less risk for impingement because you have more room. So you can see the circle kind of approximating the space for each type and you have the least space over here. Um, in reality, it's about 10 millimeters for most people. So most people, it would be about right here. Not very much, it's about 10 millimeters, but if the scapula is rotating properly, like it should, you can't really abduct your arm beyond 90 degrees without the scapula turning up. And that's what moves the acromion so that the supraspinatus tendon can, can abduct the arm. So you can see right, just I hate to get too close to this board, but right here is the supraspinatus that you can see it poking out from underneath the acromion. That's the, that's the problem with impingement is that tendon right there. Okay, so shoulder girdle joints, uh, scapulothoracic joint. This is where most of the movement happens. So on your movement and muscle sheet, when it says scapula, that's why it's because most of it happens with the scapula. And we call that the scapulothoracic. It's not a true synovial joint, because there's no joint capsule. Um, and then we do have a lesser amount of movement from the sternoclavicular and the acromioclavicular. So when we talk about things like retraction and protraction, upward and downward rotation, most of that is happening at the scapulothoracic. So the scapulothoracic joint, not a true synovial joint, um, it has a gliding type action on the posterior rib cage, elevation, depression, and so on. Um, so if we were to put numbers to this, it would be 25 degrees of abduction, adduction. So we're talking moving in the transverse plane. 
uh, we would have 60 degrees of upward and downward rotation. So swinging up and then swinging down. Uh, 55 degrees of elevation and depression. So in the anatomical position, we're already in depression. So you can't really move into more depression from the anatomical position, but we can, we can elevate. Um, so muscle support is really important because we don't have any direct support for ligaments. So it's muscles that maintain that scapular position. So remember, wherever the scapula goes, the clavicle follows. Most of the movement happens at the scapula. So let's, let's look at some practical stuff. That's what I like to do. So uh, abduction or protraction. Scapula moved laterally away from the spinal column. So sometimes physical therapists will call uh, this a push-up with a plus. So if you put your hands out just like were to complete a normal push-up. So normal push-up, generally, can you go a little bit further with protraction? So you can really spread your scapula around if you want to. That, that plus action is the, the protraction. So push-up with a plus. So that's one of the best ways to engage the serratus, uh, the serratus anterior muscle. Uh, adduction or retraction, okay, so Obviously, anytime we do a, a rowing exercise, we want we want retraction, right? So I like to call it crush the grape right there. Just crush it. And then that sets the foundation for the shoulder muscles to pull. Okay, downward rotation. So practical application. Um, a wide... Um, See if my voice will last. Wide grip front lat pull down. Wide grip front lat pull down. So in this position, the scapula uh, are upwardly rotated. And then as we pull down, that's where we get the, the downward rotation of the scapula is, is in pulling in a front lat pull down. Uh, upward rotation. Okay, so as we go from the bottom of an overhead press up over the head, Scapula have to upwardly rotate for this one as well. Okay, depression. So anatomical position, we're already in a depressed position. So the one that's usually thought about is the top position of a parallel bar dip. So at the top position of a dip, your elbows are fully extended, um, your shoulders are extended, but if you don't depress your scapula, what are you going to look like at the top? You're going to look like this, right? So what do you have to do? You have to push your shoulders down at the top. Um, so that's this depression, depression action. So um, you'd have the serratus anterior and pec minor that push the shoulders down at, at the top. And um, then, of course, elevation. So here's a, a power shrug movement. So just, just that elevation action. Okay, so five muscles. Five muscles. So we're coming up on, need to memorize these and then we'll get into nerves on Wednesday. But you've got these five muscles and a lot of times they're tensing statically to keep the scapula in a good position for the shoulder joint. So very important in providing a base of support. So a lot of times, shoulder joint problems are a symptom of scapular dysfunction. So if we, can, if we can get the scapula to work properly, and that's, remember all the, all the uh, correctives we did for lab last week? Those are just examples of correctives. So correctives are awesome because they really focus on getting the scapula to work properly. So if the scapula works properly, that means the shoulder is going to be healthier. So the key point with the company scapula movement, the humerus can only be raised to approximately 90 degrees. So we have to have the scapula working properly 
the muscles that control it working properly. So this was actually a test question. So <clears throat> in order to upwardly rotate the scapula, we have to have action of the upper trapezius, the middle trapezius, the lower trapezius, and see how all these muscles create what we call a force vector. There's a vector in each of these directions, and also with the serratus anterior pulling this way. So it's like muscles that are going to be turning the scapula. So we have scapulothoracic upward rotation. And so that's what enables the deltoid and so on to abduct, glenohumeral abduction here, would be the deltoid pulling in this direction. So all of these scapular muscles working together to allow the deltoid to do action at that joint. So I'd like to just go over a few correctives. Um, so these are in addition to stuff we've done uh, in lab. So this is a great one. Um, something if you're a, a throwing athlete, this is one that is really useful to help with uh, controlling the scapula. Couple of clips here. When athletes struggle to keep the barbell overhead during a snatch or overhead squat, they often allow the bar to fall forward. In order to fix this problem, we need to focus on activating the muscles that resist this forward collapse. This is the scapular stabilizers on the back of the shoulder. To start, grab a resistance band, perform a row, a rotation movement, and then press the band overhead. Hold this press for three seconds in the top position. This will help stabilize your scapula and position the barbell better in the overhead position. Okay. So did you see- When athletes struggle to keep the barbell overhead during a- So did you see how he incorporated three different actions of the shoulder there? So he was here and then what did he do? And back to here. So what do we call that at the shoulder? Horizontal horizontal abduction. Then what? He went like that, which is what? Shoulder external rotation. And then he went like this, which is basically just finishing off shoulder abduction. So three different actions of the shoulder at one time. And how many of you in lab, there, there is a tendency for the dowel rod to want to be here? when you do an overhead squat. And where should it be? It should be back here. So that would be a great, a great corrective exercise to learn how to keep, keep your arms where they should be. You notice when you get up here, how long do you hold it? Yeah, for that three seconds to emphasize that. So here's another great uh, corrective. Guys, we're gonna take you through the three cues that I find myself using the most when teaching serratus anterior drills. Serratus is really, really important for teaching the shoulder blade to kind of wrap around the ribcage and get into a good position of upper road rotation while keeping that scap snug to the ribcage. Um, the three that I find myself using over and over again are reach, round, and rotate. When we do the serratus anterior drills, it's very important to make people realize that we're trying to get movement of the shoulder blade on the ribcage, not just movement of the, sh the actual arm on the scapula or elbow extension. So we go through a drill like this, a lot of people will just extend their elbows or they'll crank through the front of their shoulder. What we want people to really do is get that good so wrap. that upward rotation. So when we say reach, we're actually kind of using that reach to push ourselves away from the wall. So you want preferential scapula thoracic movement. If you see a ton of elbow extensions, straight arms, it's usually a sign they're moving too much through the arm or they're really going up um, you know, excessively through the elbows insufficiently here. So instead with a good uh, straight wall side with the roller, Really, we're limited by the roller here, and all that motion is really coming from the scap. You realize that there's still a slight bend in that elbow. So that's the reach portion, reach through the shoulder blades. The second thing you'll see is a lot of the folks that really need serratus recruitment are the ones with the really flat upper back, so it's a straight up and down position. We want them to round. So what I'll actually do is I'll go up and I'll put my hand right in their upper back and I'll say, fill up this space. So push back against me and actually create that good thoracic curvature so the shoulder blades can stay snug to the rib you realize that he's recreated that, that effective typhosis that puts those shoulder blades in a good position. So you've got reach, you've got round, 
The last thing I'll do when I coach these exercises is I'll cue the actual rotational component. So we'll get right in and we'll actually guide those shoulder blades around to the armpits. Is that so I'll usually take my finger and lay on the inferior medial border, the inside and the bottom, and I'll actually help them guide it around so that we make sure that you only feel it down here in serratus. Um, you'll also get some feedback if folks get any kind of like pinching in the front, it's usually a sign they're moving too much uh, from that portion of the shoulder. So reach, round, and rotate to get good serratus into your function on the rib cage. Okay. So there's the practical application of it. So a couple things you could do on a daily basis just to have better scapular function, which leads to better shoulder joint health. Um, okay, so five muscles are primarily involved with shoulder girdle movement. So we have sites of origin um, on the axial skeleton, but they all insert on the scapula or the clavicle. So none of these muscles has any action on the shoulder joint itself. So just on shoulder girdle, uh, scapula or clavicle is where we have the action at. So. Um, as we can see here, we have the trapezius, and so that's number one. Trapezius has three different segments. We'll talk more about these on uh, Wednesday, but three different segments, and each segment has certain functions that are unique. Uh, what's surprising is that the upper region of the trapezius is responsible for scapular elevation, but the lower part is responsible for, for scapular depression. So there can be opposing functions, but all three working together are involved with uh, upward rotation. So they all have independent, but also common functions. Uh, the rhomboids are right here. So you have the rhomboid minor on top and the rhomboid major on the bottom. So usually where there's a minor, there's also a major like terrace minor, terrace major and so on. Um, those fibers are oriented almost horizontally. So remember, side of origin on the axial skeleton, side of insertion on the scapula. So muscles typically contract from the insertion in the direction of the origin. So if this muscle contracts, what's it going to do? Yeah, it's going to pull in this direction. So there's going to be a slight amount of elevation because there's kind of an upward grade to those fascicles, but mostly just retraction. So it is involved a little bit with elevation though. So this is called the levator scapula. Levator, so by the name, what do you think it does? Yeah, Ele elevates, Le levitates the scapula, right? So it's up here, inserts on the superior angle of the scapula. Um, the serratus, what a fascinating muscle. So it kind of has this serrated type um, look to it. So it originates on the first nine ribs and then has its insertion back behind on the medial border of the scapula. So the serratus has several functions, upward rotation um, as well as protraction or abduction of the scapula. Um, and different segments can be involved to different degrees because it's such a large muscle. So it, it, it can have branches of, of the same nerve that go to different parts. So not all parts are equally activated with each movement. So it's really interesting. We'll, we'll get into that uh, Wednesday. Uh, and then here is the pec minor. So not pec major, pec minor. So Pec minor is located just underneath uh, the pec major. So it has a lot of functions in common with uh, the serratus and also the rhomboids. Does it insert on the medial border too? Uh, it would have its insertion on the coracoid process. So if it contracts, it, it kind of pulls on that coracoid and pulls the scapula around as part of uh, protraction. Okay, so here they all are. Okay, and uh, one of the conditions, one of the dysfunctional conditions we see is the scapular winging effect. 
So what we can see right here is a very prominent medial border of the scapula. So if the, if the serratus is doing its job, it's going to pull the scapula into the rib cage nice and tight. So that's what uh, Coach Cressy was talking about, is we want to have that serratus activated so that this medial border is pulled in tight to the, to the rib cage. Um, and so with, with those drills like Coach Cressy was doing with um, the reach round and rotate, we can get better serratus activation so we would see less of this type of thing going on. Yeah, so say if a person you know, sits like this, that can cause a lot of stress and strain and yeah. for all of it. It could, so yeah. So professors like me, we have to constantly be like really getting our shoulders back. But um, and so I have a foam roller waiting for me every night when I get home. Um, other exercises. So in bear crawl exercise, so I know a lot of you have done this one, but in terms of correcting scapular dysfunction, how would this exercise activate the serratus just based on the position? Yeah, to effectively apply force into the ground, you have to have this, the scapula in a protracted position. So the scapula is going to be like your foundation fixed in a protracted position where you can then use the shoulder joint to effectively uh, push uh, and pull your body forward. So this is kind of a good functional exercise that um, is, it's usually done for core stabilization, but it's also great for just overall scapular stability and function. Okay. So, any questions? Okay, so that's about all I have for you today. So we'll continue on. We'll get into the neural control of these muscles on Wednesday. All right, thank you.